Hello and welcome. This week we're going to continue talking about second order linear differential equations. We will cover sections 3.4 to 3.7 of the notes. First, a quick revision of last week's lesson. We're looking at homogeneous, that's equal to zero, second order linear differential equations with constant coefficients. To solve an equation such as this, we need to find two linearly independent solutions, which we call y1 and y2. As soon as we know y1 and y2, the general solution to a differential equation will be a linear combination of y1 and y2. What we do is we write down the characteristic equation. We look at the numbers a, b, c in the differential equation, and we use the same numbers a, b, and c in a quadratic equation for r. Solve this characteristic equation to find the roots r1 and r2. There's three cases that we need to consider. Case one, the easiest case, if we have two different real numbers, then we know that the two solutions we want are e to the power r1t and e to the power r2t. If instead we have complex conjugates, then we saw last week that the two functions that we want are e to the lambda t cos mu t and e to the lambda t sine mu t. Case three we haven't done yet. What happens if the roots are repeated? That's, we will now study this case. So let's suppose that we're studying our second order linear homogeneous differential equation. And now let's suppose that the constants a, b, and c satisfy b squared minus 4ac is equal to zero. Then there's only going to be one root of the characteristic equation. The root with the repeated root is going to be minus b over 2a. We know one solution. We know that e to the power minus bt over 2a is a solution of the differential equation. But we need a second one. We need to have two linearly independent solutions. So what can we do? For example, let's suppose we want to solve y double prime plus 4y prime plus 4y is equal to 0. The characteristic equation simplifies to r plus 2 squared is equal to 0. So we have repeated roots. We have the repeated root minus 2. We know one solution. We know that y1 is e to the power minus 2t. We need to find a second linearly independent solution. And the idea is this. We know that y1 is a solution. We know that we can multiply y1 by any constant, and we still have a solution. What about if instead of multiplying by a constant, we multiply by some special function vt. Maybe vt y1t is also a solution if we can find a special function v. So this is the idea we're going to use. We're going to guess that y2 is some function v multiplied by y1 for some special function v which we don't know yet. So, and then we can differentiate two times. And we can substitute this into the differential equation. We want y2 to satisfy the differential equation. So we want y2 double prime plus 4y2 prime plus 4y2 to be equal to 0. When we substitute in and simplify, a lot of the terms disappear, and we're left with v double prime e to the power of minus 2t. 
e to the power of minus 2t is never e equal to 0. So what we must have is v double prime is equal to 0. We can choose any non-constant function. It needs to be non-constant because we need y2 to be linearly independent from y1. Any non-constant function v2, which satisfies v double prime is equal to 0. And of course, there's infinitely many solutions to v double prime is equal to 0. But I like simple functions, so I'm going to choose vt is equal to t. Then we have our second solution, y2 is equal to t multiplied by e to the power of minus 2t. We have two solutions to the differential equation. Are they linearly independent? To answer this question, we calculate the Rodskin. The Rodskin of y1 and y2 is always non-zero, so the answer is yes. y1 and y2 are both solutions to the differential equation, and they are linearly independent. This means that they form a fundamental set of solutions, and then we can write down the general solution, c1 e to the power of minus 2t plus c2 t e to the power of minus 2t. We can use the same idea to solve the general equation. We have one solution, e to the power rt, or e to the power minus bt over 2a. And we're going to guess the second solution is vt multiplied by y1. Then we can calculate, and I'm going to leave the details for you to fill in. Use the same ideas that we did in the previous example. We can calculate that the differential equation simplifies to 0 is equal to a, e to the power of minus b to over 2a, v double prime. a must be non zero, e to the power of minus b to over 2a must be non zero. We must have that v double prime is equal to 0 again. So we can just choose v equal to t as before. Then we have our second solution, t multiplied by y1, or t e to the power of rt. I'm going to leave it for you to check that the Rodskin of these two functions is non zero. As soon as we know that, we know that e to the power of rt and t e to the power of rt form a fundamental set of solutions to the differential equation. For example, solve the initial value problem, y double prime minus y prime plus a quarter of y is equal to zero with the initial conditions, y of zero is equal to two, y prime of zero is equal to one third. We can write down the characteristic equation and we can see that there is the repeated root r is equal to a half. As soon as we know this, we know the general solution to the differential equation. c1 e to the power t over 2, and then c2 t e to the power t over 2. All that's left is to choose the constant c1 and c2 to satisfy the initial condition. I will leave this for you to check when you go through this. Check that we must have that C1 is 2 and C2 is minus 2 over 3. And that's the way we solve this problem. That's all we need to do to find that the solution to the initial value problem is 2 e to the power t over 2 minus 2 thirds t e to the power t over 2. Let's do another one. 
solve y double prime minus y prime plus a quarter y is equal to zero. This is the same differential equation as in the previous example with the initial conditions y of zero is equal to two. Again, this is the same, but now I've changed the third line. I've changed y prime of zero to now be equal to, to two. I'm going to leave this for you to check, solve this problem using the technique in the previous example, and you would you can check that the solution is 2 e to the power of t over 2 plus t e to the power of t over 2. I'm going to show you the graph of this function and the graph of the solution to the previous example. If we use the initial condition y prime zero is equal to one third, we get this red function. If we use the initial condition y prime zero is equal to two, we get this blue function. One third and two are not very different. One third and two are similar numbers. There's not a huge difference between them, but we have big a big difference in the behavior of these solutions. This red function is going down to minus infinity. This blue function is going up to infinity. Let's summarize what we know so far. To solve a homogeneous second order linear differential equation with constant coefficients, we need to find two linearly independent solutions. Case one, if the, we have two different real roots, the two functions are e to the power r1t and e to the power r2t. If the roots are complex conjugates, then the two functions that we want are e to the power lambda t cos mu t and e to the power lambda t sine mu t. And now we can fill in the third line. If we have repeated roots, then the two functions that we want are e to the power r1t and t e to the power r1t. Section 3.5 is about reduction of order. This is an extension of an idea that we've used in the previous section. Consider now the linear second order homogeneous equation, y double prime plus pty prime plus qty is equal to zero. And suppose that we know one solution to this differential equation, and suppose that we want to find a second linearly independent solution. Then the main idea in this section is that we're going to make a guess. We're going to guess that the second solution, y2, is equal to v multiplied by y1 for some non-constant function v. If we can find v, then we found our y2. So what we do is we calculate with like this. We're starting with y2 is equal to vy1. Differentiate this using the product rule. y2 is v prime y1 plus vy1 prime. And differentiate a second term. y2 double prime must be v double prime y1 plus 2v prime y1 prime plus v y1 double prime. We want y2 to satisfy our differential equation. So we want y2 double prime plus p, y2 prime plus qy2 to be equal to zero. What I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute these formulae into the differential equation. Like this, and then I'm going to rearrange to gather together all of the v double prime, the v prime, and the v terms. We've got one v double prime term. That's v double prime y1. 
the terms involving V prime, we have two of them, 2y1 prime and py1. And we have three terms which include V. y1 double prime plus py1 prime plus qy1. But we're assuming that y1 is a solution to the differential equation. So we know that this last bracket is all equal to zero. So what we have is V double prime Y1 plus V prime 2Y1 prime plus P Y1. Now, before I go on, let me remark that we must always get a zero here. Because y1 solves the differential equation, we must always get zero v when we do reduction of order. If you're trying to do a reduction of order and you get something other than zero here, then it means that you've made a mistake. You need to go back and recheck your work. This equation with v double prime and v prime is actually a first order ODE for v prime. To see this, we're going to make a substitution. We're going to replace V prime by U. Then instead of V double prime, we can write U prime. And instead of V prime, we can write U. You can now see that this is, in fact, a first order differential equation. If we can find U, if we can solve a first order equation to find U, then we can integrate u to get v and then multiply v by y1 to get y2. So instead of having to solve a second order differential equation, we just need to solve a first order differential equation. This is why this technique is called reduction of order. So let's summarize. Step one, we're going to guess that y2 is equal to v multiplied by y1. We're going to put this into our differential equation and we're going to find an equation for v. Remembering that our equation must always include zero v at the end. We're going to do the substitution, u is equal to v prime to get a first order differential equation for u. We know how to solve first order equations, so we can find u. As soon as we know u, we integrate u to get v. And then step six, as soon as we know v, we can multiply it by y1 to get y2. Let's do an example. We're told that one divided by t is a solution of this differential equation. And we're asked to find a linearly independent second solution. If I give you a reduction of order equation, a reduction of order question, I'm probably going to phrase it like this. I'm going to tell you, that I'm going to tell you one solution, and then I'm going to ask you to find a linearly independent second solution. So we're starting with y1 is 1 divided by t. And we're going to start with the guess that y2 is equal to v multiplied by y1. Or to write this another way, we're starting with y2 is equal to v multiplied by t to the power minus 1. We differentiate this two times to get y2 prime and y2 double prime. And then we're going to substitute them into the differential equation. We want y2 to satisfy the differential equation. So we want 2t squared y2 double prime plus 3t y2 prime minus y2 is equal to 0. 
can substitute the orange, green, and red formula in here. And then we're going to simplify and rearrange. We're going to gather together all of the V double prime terms, all of the V prime terms, and all of the V terms. For V double prime, it's 2t squared multiplied by t to the power minus 1. So that gives 2t. For the V prime terms, here's a V prime, here's a V prime. That's the same as minus 4 plus 3. For the V terms, we get 2t squared multiplied by 2v to the power minus 3, which is the same as 4 t to the power minus 1. Just 3t multiplied by minus t to the power minus 2, which is minus 3 t to the power minus 1. And there's also minus t to the power minus 1. And of course, 4 minus 3 minus 1 is equal to 0 which it should be. We should always get equal to zero in the V term. So we're left with zero is equal to 2t V double prime minus V prime. We do our substitution. We let U be equal to V prime and we obtain a first order differential equation for u. 2t du dt minus u is equal to zero. This equation is both linear and separable. So you know two ways to solve this differential equation. I'm choosing to solve this as a separable differential equation. Here's the whole calculation. This should be revision for you, so I'm going to talk through this very, very quickly. I'm rearranging the equation so that all of the u terms are on the left and all of the t terms are on the right. Because I've separated the variables, I'm allowed to integrate both sides. I get the natural logarithm of the absolute value of u is equal to a half. Natural logarithm of the absolute value of t plus a constant. Rearrange this, we find that u is plus or minus e to the power capital C, t to the power of a half. Introduce a new constant called small c instead of plus or minus e to the power of capital C. We get small c, t to the power of a half. For the time being, we're going to leave the constant c here. I've repeated this at the top of the slide. We found that u is c t to the power of a half. To find v, we just integrate. The integral of u is 2 thirds c t to the power 3 over 2 plus a new constant k. As soon as we know v, we multiply by y1 to get y2. y2 must be 2 thirds c t to the power of a half plus k t to the power of minus 1. Now remember, we're trying to find a solution that is linearly independent from y1. We can use this to choose the constants to simplify y2. The second term, that's the k t to the power minus 1, this is just a constant multiplied by y1. We don't need this. We already have y1. We're just trying to find a linearly independent second solution. So we, we could just choose k is equal to 0, and we can just forget about this term.
Then we're left with y2 is equal to 2 thirds c, t to the power half. This will be our linear independent solution for any non-zero non constant c. Again, I like simple functions, so I'm going to choose a value of c, which makes this a nice simple function. Just to make this nice and simple, I'm going to choose c is equal to 3 over 2. Then y2 simplifies to t to the power of a half. I'm going to leave it for you to check that the Ronskin of t to the power minus 1 and t to the power of half is not always 0. That then shows that we have two linearly independent solutions to the differential equation. Another example. The question tells us that y1 is equal to t is a solution of this differential equation. And we're asked to find a second linearly independent solution, y2. We start the same way every time we do reduction of order. We're going to start by guessing that y2 is equal to v multiplied by y1, or in other words, v multiplied by t. Differentiate two times and put into the differential equation. This time I'm going to skip through this quickly, but I leave this for you to double check at a later date. We get zero is equal to t squared, t v double prime plus four v prime. And of course, plus zero v, because we always have plus zero v when we do reduction of order. We can cancel off the t squared. We're left with t v double prime plus 4 v prime is equal to 0. And we can do the substitution u is equal to v prime to get our first order differential equation. t du dt plus 4 u is equal to 0. This is a separable equation. We know how to solve separable equations. Again, this should be revision for you. Rearrange it so that all of the u terms are on the left, all of the t terms are on the right. Integrate it and then rearrange. u must be some constant small c, t to the power minus 4. What do we have so far? We know that y1 is t, we know that v prime is equal to u, and we know that u is c t to the power minus 4. Because v prime is equal to u, v must be the integral of u. So v must be minus 1 third c t to the power minus 3 plus k. And therefore, y2 must be minus one third c t to the power minus 2 plus kt. We don't need the plus kt because this is just a constant multiplied by y1. So just choose k is equal to 0. We're left with minus one third c to the t to the power minus 2. Again, we can choose any non-zero c. So choose a nice number, which will make this a choose a number which will make this a nice function. We could choose, for example, c is equal to minus three, and then we're left with y two is equal t to the power of minus two. Now, have we made a mistake in this calculation? Let's do some checks. Does y2 really solve the differential equation? Let's check it. Differentiate two times, put into the differential equation, 
and it turns out that we get zero. So the answer is yes. This really is a solution to the differential equation. Are our two functions linearly independent? Let's check. We calculate Rodskin and we get minus three t to the power of minus two. And this is non-zero because t is always strictly greater than zero. This was specified in the question. The question said t is always strictly greater than zero. This tells us that y1 and y2 are linearly independent. So y1 and y2 form a fundamental set of solutions. Section 3.6 is about non-homogeneous equations. Now we're going to be looking at equations of the form y double prime plus pty prime plus qty is equal to gt non-homogeneous as long as gt is not always equal to zero. If we have a non-homogeneous linear equation like this, we could replace the g by zero and we get an equation which is called the homogeneous equation corresponding to the equation that we started with. Here, a general solution to a non-homogeneous linear equation can be written like this. C1y1 plus C2y2 plus capital Y, where y1 and y2 form a fundamental set of solutions to the homogeneous equation corresponding to five, C1 and C2 are constants, and capital Y is a particular solution to our non-homogeneous equation. We know how to find Y1 and Y2. We know how to do C1, Y1 plus C2, Y2, because we've been studying it last week and this week. We need to just find some extra function and then add it on to the end. Let me summarize. If I want to solve a non-homogeneous equation, L of y is equal to g, we have three steps. Step one, we solve the homogeneous equation corresponding to our differential equation. We find a particular solution to our differential equation, and then we can add them together. We're going to study two methods to do step two. We're going to study one method this week, and then we're going to study the second method next week. The method that we're going to study this week is called the method of undetermined coefficients. And the idea goes like this. When we have a non-homogeneous linear differential equation, we're going to look at g. We're going to make a guess. We're going to guess that our solution looks like g, but includes some constants. And then we're going to try to find the constants. For example, find a particular solution to y double prime minus 3y prime minus 4y is equal to 3e to the power of t. So, so it's equal to 3e to the power of 2t. In this example, our function g is equal to 3e to the power of 2t. We're going to look at this function and we're going to make a guess. G is number multiplied by e to the power of 2t. We're going to guess that our particular solution is also number multiplied by e to the power of 2t. 
So we're going to make be making the guess that the particular solution that we run is a e to the power two t for some constant capital A. We need to try to find capital A. Starting with capital Y is A e to the power two t. Differentiate this twice and then put into the differential equation. We want three e to the power two t to be equal to y double prime minus three y prime minus four y. Substitute in y, y prime, y double prime. Simplify, we get minus six a e to the power two t. Three e to the power two t must be the same as minus six a e to the two t. Cancel the e to the two t's. Three must be equal to minus six a, or a must be minus a half. And then we're done. Therefore, our particular solution must be minus a half e to the power 2t. Let's do another example. Find a particular solution to y double prime minus 3y prime minus 4y is equal to 40 squared minus 1. Now our function g of t is a second degree polynomial. We're going to guess that our particular solution is also a second degree polynomial. So we're guessing that our particular solution is a t squared plus b t plus c for some constant a, b and c. I'm going to leave this example for you to finish. Differentiate capital Y twice, put it into the differential equation, and find A, B, and C. There's a word which might, might be a new word for you. This word ansatz means a mathematical guess. Next example. Find a particular solution to y double prime minus 3y prime minus 4y is equal to 2 sine t. First guess. Here's a clue here. Why am I saying first guess? The first guess I'm going to make is because the function g is number multiplied by sine t, I'm going to guess that particular solution is also number multiplied by sine t. Differentiate two times and then put into the differential equation. We are left with 2 sine t is minus 5a sine t minus 3a cos t. Now, wait a minute, 2 sine t on the left, but it's really 2 sine t plus 0 cos t. So 2 sine t and minus 5a sine t, these must be the same. 0 cos t must be the same as minus 3a cos t. But we can't solve this. This linear system is inconsistent. It's not possible to find a constant A which satisfies both of these equations. So this guess failed. Why did it fail? It failed because when we differentiate sine, we introduce cos into um, the equation. We need a better guess. For the second guess, let's suppose we start with both sine and cos. Let's suppose our particular solution is a sine t plus b cos t. Yeah, differentiate two times and put into the differential equation. You can check that we get minus 5a plus 3b sine t. 
This must be the same as 2 sine t. And we get minus 3a minus 5b cos t. On the left, it's 0 cos t. So this must be equal to 0. We need to find a and b, which solves this linear system. Uh, this linear system is, in fact, consistent. You can check that the solution to this linear system is a is equal to minus 5 over 17 and b is equal to 3 over 17. And that's all we need. Then we can write down that the particular solution is minus 5 over 17 sine t plus 3 over 17 cos t. There's a lesson here. Sine and cos are friends. They always go together. If you see either sine or cos in the function g of t, then your ansatz, that's your guess, needs to include both sine and cos. Likewise, shine and cosh also always go together. If you see either shine or cosh in g of t, then your ansatz needs to include both shine and cosh. Find a particular solution to y double prime minus 3y prime minus 4y is equal to minus 8 e to the power t cos 2t. Now we get a little bit more complicated. We need to make a guess. We need an ansatz. So what we do is we look at our function g of t. Minus 8 is a number, and then we have e to the power t cos 2t. Which we guessed that our ansatz also has a number, and then e to the power t cos 2t. But remember, sine and cos always go together. If we have sine or cos, we need to have both sine and cos in our ansatz. So we must also have plus b e to the power t sine 2t. We're going to differentiate two times and put into the differential equation. These are two derivatives of capital Y. Please check this when you have more time. Let's substitute this into the differential equation. Simplify and rearrange. Minus 8 e to the power t cos 2t must be the same as minus 10a minus 2b e to the power t cos 2t. And because there are no sine terms on the left, 2a minus 3b e to the power of t sine 2t must be equal to 0. In other words, we need to solve 10a plus 2b is equal to 8. I've just multiplied by minus 1. And 2a minus 10b is equal to 0. You know how to solve linear systems like this from linear on your linear algebra course. You can check that if we solve this, we get a is 10 over 13 and b is 2 over 13. Then we know the answer. The particular solution must be 10 over 13 e to the power t cos 2t plus 2 over 13 e to the power t sine 2t. Theorem. Let's suppose we have two different non-homogeneous differential equations. But let's suppose that the left-hand sides of the two equations are the same. 
ay double prime plus by prime plus cy is the same in both equations same a same b same c but let's suppose we have different functions on the right g1 and g2 and suppose that we know that capital y1 solves the first differential equation and capital y2 solves the second differential equation then because our differential equations are linear we can add the two solutions together to get a solution to a y double prime plus b y prime plus c y is equal to g1 plus g2 We could use this theorem to solve this problem. Find a particular solution to y double prime minus 3y prime minus 4y is equal to 3e to the power 2t plus 2 sine t minus 8e to the power t cos 2t. We can split this problem up into three easier problems. A green equation, an orange equation, and a blue equation. But we've already solved these. We already know a particular we already know particular solutions to all of these three differential equations. So the, a particular solution to equation seven must just be the sum of these three particular solutions minus a half e to the power 2t solves the green equation this orange function solved the orange equation and this blue function solves the blue equation add them together and we end up with a particular solution to equation seven So let me just recap. If we want to find a particular solution to a non-homogeneous second order linear differential equation such as this, we look at the function g and we choose a similar function for capital Y. This method doesn't always work. There's one difficulty that, that can occur, as I'm going to show in the next example. Find a particular solution to y double prime plus 4y is equal to 3 cos 2t. We use the same ideas as before. g of t is number cos 2t, so we're going to guess that the particular solution is number cos 2t. Because we have cos, we must also have sine, so we must also have plus b sine 2t. And I've written the first guess here. So this is a clue that. This is not going to work, and we're going to need to make a second guess. Let's see how it doesn't work. Differentiate two times, put into the differential equation, and we're left with 3 cos 2t is equal to 0. Um, this is not right. This can't be true for all t. It's not possible to choose a and b such that 3 cos 2t is equal to 0 for t. So our, method, our guess has failed. Why did this happen? Why did this usual method not work? Why did our ansatz fail? To understand why, I want to solve the homogeneous equation y double prime plus 4y is equal to 0. The characteristic equation is this. The roots are plus and minus 2i. So the general solution to the homogeneous equation is c1 cos 2t plus c2 sine 2t. The rule is cos, cos 2t and sine 2t appear in the general solution to the homogeneous equation. We cannot use the same functions in a particular solution. If in doubt, multiply by t. 
we need to find two functions that, when we differentiate them, give us cos 2t and sine 2t times. What we're going to do is we're going to try t cos 2t and t sine 2t, because when we differentiate these two functions, we get cos 2t and sine 2t terms, as well as t is cos 2t and t sine 2t terms. So let's make another guess, second guess. The second guess is the same as the first guess, except now I've multiplied by t. Let me just write down the calculation for you to look at quickly. We differentiate capital Y twice, put it into the differential equation. All of the T cos 2T and T sine 2T terms should cancel. And we're left with 3 cos 2T is the same as 4B cos 2T minus 4A sine 2T. 3 must be the same as 4B. 4A must be 0. So clearly A must be 0 and B must be 3 over 4. That gives us our particular solution. 3 over 4 T sine 2 T. Any time you're trying to do um, the method of undetermined coefficients, if G is the same, includes the same functions as the solution to the homogeneous equation corresponding to the differential equation, you need to multiply by t and try again. It still doesn't work, multiply by t again and so on. That is the end of this week's lesson. Next week we're going to finish chapter 3. We'll talk about how to solve initial value problems um, using non-homogeneous equations. We will study the method of variation of parameters, which is our second method to find a particular solution to a non-homogeneous linear equation. And then briefly, we will extend our, our ideas to higher order linear differential equations. Are there any questions?